Hi, everybody. I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening. And I'd also like to thank David Darcy from the Art Newspaper for agreeing to moderate our discussion. And my colleagues, Courtney Donner and Christina Roman for helping orchestrate our presentation. My talk is going to be followed by a conversation between David and myself, and then we'll take questions from the audience. You can enter questions at any point using the chat function at the bottom of your screen. David, are you on mute? <laughs> Unmute yourself. There we are. Okay. Okay. Hi, David. Hi. Okay. Well, as you may know, the Clear Research Institute was established in 2017 to further the scholarship of Jane's grandfather, Otto Kallir. This evening's talk is the first of a two-part series examining his legacy. The second installment scheduled for October 26th will discuss Jane's grandfather's activities as a collector and a scholar. We begin, however, with a discussion of the art most closely associated with him and his galleries in Vienna and New York. Saved from Europe was the title of an exhibition clear organized in 1940 at the Gallery Saint-Étienne in New York. The title reflected his efforts to preserve the work of artists like Klimt, Schiele, and Kokoschka, whose achievements were then threatened with obliteration by the Nazis. More broadly, more broadly, the title reflects Kallir's lifelong commitment to the work of these and other pioneering Austrian modernists. Otto Kallir's interest in art began in childhood, and as a teenager, he took drawing lessons. His teacher, Johannes Itten, would later become well known for teaching color theory at the Bauhaus. I don't think my grandfather ever seriously considered becoming an artist, but he did have an artist's eye, an innate visual sense that provided the key to his eventual career. He also had an appreciation for fine printing and typography, having apprenticed at his uncle's lithography shop. So in 1919, after concluding his military service, my grandfather decided to go into the art publishing business. His first project was a limited edition portfolio of Itten lithographs. Limited edition print portfolios were at the time experiencing a boom in Germany and Austria, driven by post-war inflation and a growing need to exchange currency for tangible goods before it became devalued. My grandfather teamed up with Richard Kohler, an investor who owned the Ricola Publishing Company. Kola allowed Otto to establish his own art print, the Verlag Neuer Graphic, under the Ricola umbrella. Between 1919 and 1923, the Verlag Neuer Graphic issued roughly 30 prints and portfolios, of which the best remembered is Das Grafische Werk von Egon Schiele, comprising the first published editions of the artist's etchings and his two final lithographs. In 1923, with Ricola on the brink of bankruptcy, my grandfather decided to open an art gallery, which he called the Neue Galerie. The concept of newness, expressed in the names of both his Verlag and gallery, was closely associated with Austrian modernism. Um, I'm just looking just looking at the, I'm sorry, just a second, I was just looking at the chat. Does, can everybody hear? I'm getting some comments here about people not being able to hear. Does somebody? Loud and clear. Okay, okay, sorry about that. Sorry to interrupt there. Um, so anyway, to get back to the Verlag Neue Graphic and the Neue Gallery. Um, I think this concept of newness was something that my grandfather took from Sheila, who had called his artistic group established in 1909, the Neue Kunstgruppe. Sheila was my grandfather's lodestar all his life. So not surprisingly, my grandfather inaugurated the Neue Gallery with Sheila's first posthumous retrospective. 
The artist had died just five years earlier in 1918, when he was only beginning to experience critical and financial success. Now it was up to others to sustain his reputation and create a market for his work. In keeping with his passion for Sheila, my grandfather was drawn to the work of artists with a humanistic orientation, artists capable of extracting profound insights from the minutiae of daily life. He showed Austrians like Klimt, Kokoschka, Alfred Kubin, Ludwig Heinrich Jungnickel, and Oskar Laska, and he also brought the work of foreign modernists, including Edvard Munch, Max Beckmann, Lobis Corinth, Paul Signac, Auguste Renoir, and Vincent van Gogh to Vienna. There were group shows of the French Impressionists, the Russian avant-garde, and the Italian Futurists, and quirky detours like a 1927 presentation of Cacti. For larger presentations, such as a 1928 Sheila retrospective, the Neue Galerie teamed up with the Hagenbund Artist Society. After parting company with the Ricola Verlag, my grandfather renamed his publishing arm the Johannes Presse after my father, who, like the Neue Galerie, was born in 1923. The Johannes Presse continued to publish limited edition books and portfolios containing original prints with a special emphasis on Alfred Kubin. From a present day vantage point, I think Otto Kalir's two most important achievements during the Vienna years were the publication of the first Sheila catalog resume, which documented the artists' paintings and their ownership before the works were dispersed during and after the Holocaust, and his discovery of the then unknown painter, Richard Gerstel. When Gerstel took his life in 1908 at the age of 25, he had exhibited only once in a student show. His family stored the surviving oeuvre in a warehouse where the canvases remained rolled up torn and dirty for the next 23 years. In 1931, Richard's brother Alois brought a few of these smaller paintings to the Neue Galerie, which by then was known for its advocacy of cutting edge art. Alois asked my grandfather whether the family should continue paying storage fees for the works or just throw them out. Convinced that he was dealing with a quote, discovery of great artistic interest Clear had the canvases cleaned and stretched and cataloged the entire oeuvre. Gerstel's first one-person show ever, subtitled A Painter's Fate, opened at the Neue Galerie in September 1931. It was an immediate sensation. The press dubbed Gerstel the Austrian Van Gogh, and the international response was such that my grandfather immediately sent the exhibition on tour to Germany, where it was presented in Munich, Berlin, Cologne, and Aachen. However, on January 30th, 1933, just a few days after the show opened in Aachen, Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany. Of the Austrian painters associated with the Neue Gallery, only Oskar Kokoschka was sufficiently well known in Germany to be directly targeted by the Nazis. But it didn't matter. Austria had its own fascist dictator, Engelbert Dollfuss. In tandem with this political shift, tastes became more conservative and works by expressionists like Gerstel and Schiele lost much of their audience. Between 1930 and 1932, Schiele watercolor prices declined by 80%. The Neue Galerie was forced to focus on more traditional 19th century material. The gallery's financial problems were compounded by the depression that swept through Europe following the 1929 US stock market crash. To make ends meet, my grandfather sublet some of the Neue Galerie space to an acting school and took up a side gig photographing local stage and opera stars. Kalir was acutely aware of the political precariousness of his position. 
He closely followed events in Germany and had no illusions about what would happen to him and his family if Hitler ever came to Austria. He began preparing to immigrate immediately after the, Austria, after the Nazi Anschluss in March 1938. Before leaving Austria, my grandfather transferred the Neue Galerie to his secretary, Vita Künster, who wasn't Jewish. This was a rare example of a so-called friendly Aryanization, unlike the forced sales that were so common at the time. Künstler did her best to preserve the gallery's inventory intact and returned it voluntarily to Kalir after World War II. In the meantime, she supervised the packing up of my grandparents' apartment so that its contents could be sent to them abroad. My grandfather was fortunate insofar as much of the art he handled was of no interest to the Nazis, and there were no export restrictions on living artists who, like Sheila and Klimt, had died within the last 20 years. So he was able to export much of his inventory and household property. My grandfather hoped to settle the family, including also my grandmother, father, and aunt, in Switzerland, but the Swiss wouldn't give him a work permit. So Kalir traveled on to Paris, where he opened a new gallery. He called this one Saint Etienne after the Cathedral of Saint Stephen, which stood about a block from the original Noya Gallery. The French did allow my grandfather to work, but they wouldn't permit the rest of the family to join him in Paris. Now they had to find a third country that would accept everyone. It took over a year for Otto Collier to secure the necessary visas. Finally, in September 1939, my family arrived in New York, where my grandfather established what he then thought was an American branch of the Paris Gallery Saint Etienne. However, the German occupation of France in June 1940 eliminated any hope of a quick return to Europe. The Gallery Saint Etienne on West 57th Street opened in November 1939 with an exhibition of classical Austrian masters, complemented for good measure by Viennese porcelain and a selection of major musical manuscripts. My grandfather pulled out all the stops, or so he thought, and the presentation surely would have been a hit in Vienna. However, in New York, it was a complete flop. The Herald Tribune called the show, quote, a quaint display. If Kalir couldn't count on his own old 19th century standbys to pull his new gallery through, he suspected he was in even greater trouble with modern Austrian art. Klimt, Sheila and Kubin at the time had absolutely no international standing or market. Only Kokoschka was known in the United States. Rather than switching course, however, my grandfather decided to redouble his efforts on behalf of the Austrian modernists. If all Austrian art was unsaleable, he might as well focus on what he loved. In the summer of 1940, less than a year, after his arrival in the US, he decided to showcase what he considered the most important works he brought to New York in an exhibition he called, quite simply, Saved from Europe. These works, he noted in the press release, have escaped destruction by air raids, fire or water, or at best, he added facetiously, the honor of wandering into some Nazi collection. In a very real sense, Saved from Europe set forth the Gallery Saint Etienne's agenda for the ensuing decades. The show included a few works by well known Europeans, such as this spectacular Picasso self portrait, which had been brought to the US by the family of the Austrian poet Hugo von Hofmannsthal. But the emphasis was on pioneering Germans and Austrians, such as Paula Motorson Becker who finally made it into MoMA in 2017, Lovis Corinth, Kata Kolwitz, Gustav Klimt, and of course, Egon Schiele. 
Unfortunately, the response to the Save from Europe show was once again hardly encouraging. Quote, a good many of these canvases by reputable Europeans are definitely worth saving from Europe, the Herald Tribune commented. We are not sure, however, that the reception here to the paintings of Sheila and Klimt will be all that may be expected for them. It is difficult to awaken enthusiasm at this time for artists so little known and appreciated here and for so many years past from the contemporary scene in Europe." End quote. Americans, Collier noted, were only interested in French art and then only if the prices were low. The impact of the Great Depression lingered. Not surprisingly, Sheila's first American one-man show, held at the Gallery saint Etienne in November 1941, was an almost complete disaster. With watercolors priced at $60, drawings at 20, only one work sold. This painting, which was purchased for $250, the equivalent of about $2,800 today, uh, by a refugee collector who paid out the sum over a period of a year and a half in monthly installments of $13. My grandfather really didn't know anyone in America outside the refugee community, and none of them had much money. Compounding these difficulties, he hadn't known much English before immigrating, and his attempts to master the language proceeded slowly. Nonetheless, Collier persisted. Throughout the 1940s, he continued exhibiting the work of Sheila, Klimt, Kokoschka, Kubin, and other Austrians. And by the mid 1950s, he began to have some success. He used various tactics to establish the Austrian masters in America. In addition to nurturing a collector base through repeated exhibitions, he also enlisted the support of museums. If he couldn't sell the work, he'd give it away. In 1956, he donated Gustav Klimt's beautiful painting, Pear Tree, to the Fogg Art Museum at Harvard. And the following year, he sold the Museum of Modern Art its first Klimt. Bolstered by this institutional support, the Gallery Saint Etienne mounted Klimt's first American one man show in 1959. It's hard to believe that the artist, today a staple of dorm room posters and coffee mugs, had never before had a solo exhibition in the US. But Collier had previously hesitated in part because the artist's drawings lacked the color and decorative impact of his oils. My grandfather needed not only a sufficient number of paintings, but also a public that was primed to accept Klimt in his entirety. Another landmark was the acquisition in 1954 of Sheila's monumental portrait of Paris von Gütersloh by the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. In order to get the painting into the museum, Collier dropped the price to $1,500, which was a bargain even then. One of my grandfather's staunchest allies at, in the museum community was Thomas M. Messer, a Czech emigre who fell in love with Sheila at the Gallery St. Etienne in the 1950s. Messer and Collier collaborated on the first museum exhibition of the artist's work, which opened at the Boston Institute of Contemporary Art, where Messer was then director, in October 1960, and then traveled to four additional institutions across the country, including the Gallery Saint Etienne. When several years later, Messer was appointed director of the Guggenheim, Collier immediately approached him about doing another Sheila show. That exhibition, which paired Sheila with Klimt, opened at the Guggenheim in 1965 and really put both painters on the map. In gratitude, my grandparents gave the Guggenheim Sheila's portrait of his father-in-law, Johann Harms. The so-called portrait of an old man was Collier's first Sheila acquisition. He'd shown it to my grandmother sitting in another dealer's window when they were courting in 1922, and the painting had accompanied them everywhere ever since. 
Shortly before my grandfather's death in 1978, he and my grandmother gave Klimt's baby to the National Gallery of Art. This final donation, I think, was particularly meaningful to Kalir because it represented the recognition by his adopted land of Austria's contributions to modernism. My grandfather sadly didn't live to witness the Vienna 1900 boom of the 1980s, which saw major survey exhibitions at the Venice Biennale, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and in Vienna itself. Since that time, books and exhibitions on fin de siècle Vienna have become so common and so popular, it's hard to imagine a time when this art was completely unknown outside of Austria. But that resurgence would never have happened without my grandfather's painstaking persistent. I find it significant that Ronald Lauder chose to call his museum for Austrian and German art, the Neue Galerie, after my grandfather's original gallery. And indeed, since its founding in 2001, much of the New York Neue Gallery's programming has in fact honored the artists whom Kalir introduced to the United States. Even Richard Gerstel, who he feared would never achieve international recognition. In the end, my grandfather's mission to save Austrian modernism for posterity proved successful perhaps beyond even his wildest dreams. Jane, uh, well, hello everyone. I'm David Darcy from the Art Newspaper. And Jane and I are going to talk a little bit before she will answer questions from all of you out there. I'm sure there's a multitude. Uh, Jane, it seems that showing and selling Austrian art in the US was a very lonely activity in the 1940s and the 1950s, unless you were spending time with other Austrians who didn't have any, any money to buy that art. Was your grandfather the only person showing and selling these artists then? Pretty much, yes. Um, Germany had a much larger art market and many more dealers in modern art than Austria did. It also had um, connections with Paris so that the market for German expressionism was much more international at the time than the market for Austrian expressionism. So to the extent that there were other refugee dealers during the period, they were all Germans. My grandfather was the only Austrian refugee who was actively uh, working in New York at the time, promoting that material. And he did have cordial relationships with his German colleagues and also with some of the German refugees who ended up in American museums, but there really wasn't anybody out there going to bat for the Austrians except him. So, and, and so let's say from 1920 to around 1940, these Austrian artists hadn't seeped into the market just, you know, by osmosis, by the way that things happening in Europe found their way into to American cities and maybe even to American museums. No, not at all. They, 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 there was only one person in the United, well, okay, no, there were two people, exactly two people in the US that I'm aware of um, that had collected Austrian art before World War II. One was Schofield Thayer, who in fact was a client of the Neue Gallery in Vienna, and his collection is now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And the other person was Bruce Duff, who had been, Bruce Duff was a very, very renowned architect and a colleague and I think also student of Frank Lloyd Wright. And he'd been turned on to Klimt by Frank Lloyd Wright and had two Klimt paintings. Uh, but that was it and those were private collections and there was no public exposure. Okay, getting back to your grandfather's biography, there's something I was really un completely unaware of and that was when things got tight in the late twenties and early thirties, 
He helped make ends meet as a photographer, taking pictures of stage and opera stars. Had he been trained as a photographer and did the experience of photographer have any effect on his taste at all? Well, it's an interesting question. This is something actually we're going to address in the second webinar um, in October. My grandfather loved what he called technical things, everything, everything having to do with new technology just really, really excited him. And that included photography. And he was an excellent amateur photographer. Uh, but I don't think he totally considered photography to be a fine art form at that point. And did it, did that in any way affect his taste visually? I think that, think? I think his visual taste affected his photographs. I mean, he just had a very acute visual taste. But I don't think he was taking photographs, but he was, I don't know that he was looking at other people's photographs as such as art. Does that answer I'm, your question? I'm sort of. I mean, it sort of reverses the what we might have thought was the, the obvious influence where the new medium would would might have might enter into his mind and affect his taste. Whereas maybe um, I don't think that you know the the influence of photography during this period was very oblique. And a lot of artists who worked from photographs and, you know, and starting already with the impressionists in the 19th century, a lot of artists did work from photographs, but they kept it secret. I mean, there was really sort of this idea that fine art and photography were two different things. And fine art was supposed to be doing things that photography couldn't do, which led, you know, obviously to the development of a more expressive or more abstract approach to fine art. Right. Okay. Now, you mentioned that Otto Kallier transferred the ownership to, of his gallery to Vita Kunstler, who was not Jewish, in a process that you describe as friendly Aryanization. That's a term I hadn't heard before. And that he was able, even after the war, to recover that property. Uh, can you talk a bit more about that? Because so much of what so many of us have been talking about and studying and writing about for the last 30 years or so is an Aryanization that really was take, was you know in the form of seizure, plunder, um, sometimes followed by deportation, and certainly with, if work got, if work was recovered, it was with great difficulty. So can you talk a bit more about ab that? Ab absolutely, and I'll also try to address one of the, pe uh, the questions coming in here uh, from Tim Benson at LACMA, because this has bearing on, on the subject. Um, obviously, there were people who tried to take advantage of Jews. Uh, but there were also people who tried to help. You know, there, 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 was a lot, there were a lot of people who had friends and connections. And I don't know um, how common a friendly Aryanization was. I, I, don't, I can't think of other examples, but basically, uh, the Nazis pretty quickly made it illegal for Jews to own businesses. And that, of course, triggered um, these so-called Aryanizations, which were usually forced sales of a Jewish-owned business to a non-Jewish proprietor. Um, and my grandfather uh, basically gave the gallery to Vita uh, so that she could continue to run it and save it for her for the duration of the war. Uh, and that, you know, they had this understanding and that is precisely what they did. Now, Tim is asking, um, how did my grandfather get the art out? And I may have blurred over some of the dates here. My grandfather was out of Austria by June, 1938. 
Um, the asset declarations that some of you may have heard about had to be filed by July 31st, 1938. Uh, and most of the art that he owned didn't have, didn't require, I mean, the, the avant-garde art, the degenerate art, a lot of 19th century art he had to um, leave behind. But the art he cared most about um, didn't need an export permit, and he was he got out and got out with the art very, very, very early. It wasn't that he waited until 1939. Right. You also mentioned something that I was unaware of, which was Oscar Kokoschka was better known when Kalir arrived in New York, better known in the United States than Klimt or Sheila, which is not something that I would have expected. Explain that. Why was he, know, why was he known? I, First I of all, I guess given the context you were talking about, why was he known at all? And why was he better known than these other artists? Okay, before I do that, I'm going to relay a comment from the audience. When I talk, can you mute the microphone because it's apparently creating an echo. Sorry, okay. Okay, let's see if that's better. Um, I think it is. Uh, okay, so the main difference between Kokoschka, Klimt, and Sheila was that Kokoschka was alive. Klimt and Sheila had died in 1918. Klimt and Sheila had really never developed much of an international reputation during their lifetimes because they died so young, whereas Kokoschka had gone to Berlin already, I think, in 1909 or 1910. So Kokoschka had much more aggressive representation by the German dealers, which means that he had much more extensive international reach, um, even between the two world wars, whereas Klimt and Schiele had never made it out of Austria, not during their lifetimes and not immediately thereafter. Right. You meant you another thing I, I wanted to ask you to expand on, and that is you did talk quite a bit about your grandfather's efforts to get the Austrian art that we are talking about into museums in the United States, which was in itself difficult enough. Did collecting, did private collecting follow from that? Was there was there was there an effect that seeing the art in the museums would bring people eventually to the gallery. Did it operate that way? What got <coughs> what got the art, art beyond the museums? Sure, I'll, I'll tell you that you're going to mute, right? Okay, um, I'm also going to address one of the questions at the same time again because it's germane to David's question. Um, other dealers jumped into the arena of Austrian art basically in the 1960s. And in terms of galleries, you know, specifically like La Boissie, which was run by Helen Serger and Serge Sabarsky's gallery, all of that, I think, began in the mid to late 60s. I don't have the exact dates, but that Guggenheim show was a huge, huge, catalyst in terms of launching uh, Klimt and Sheila and the other Austrians beyond the realm of the refugee community. Now, before that, uh, what was going on um, at the Gallery of St. Etienne and with my grandfather's collaborations with Thomas Messer was a kind of a, a, a back and forth, a sort of a ping pong game where you'd have shows at the gallery, increasing outside appreciation, museums come, museums see the show. My grandfather tries to entice them by offering them gifts. Uh, famously, he offered Alfred Barr at the Museum of Modern Art his choice of any Sheila painting in inventory and Barr turned him down. Uh, so it was, you know, Building museum recognition, building credibility, 
with the collectors. It went back and forth and back and forth. The first successful Sheila show that my grandfather mounted, he mounted in 1957. That was the first time that he did a Sheila show. I think it was the gallery's third or fourth Sheila show. It was the first time that he really sold much of anything. And it was the first time that he sold to people who were not refugees. One, one last thing before we take it out to the broader audience. We're also, after 1950 or so, when things started to get back to normal, were Austrians buying from your grandfather? Was there a European clientele for this art, which had been you know, the European clientele before the war or something like it? Um, to some extent, yes. I mean, first of all, there were Austrian refugees here who gradually got back on their feet and had enough money to begin collecting. Um, so there were there were collectors here. For example, Gertrude Mellon had an Austrian con con connection. Um, Frederick Gerstel uh, was an Austrian immigrant who eventually had enough to also begin buying from the gallery, saying you can. Um, in Europe, um, again, all, all of this begins to take off in the 1960s. Um, you have uh, the Galleria Galatea doing an, a major Sheila show in 1963. That show travels to Marlboro Fine Art in London in 1964. And Marlboro Fine Art became, that show was another really important landmark in terms of stimulating European interest and getting the European collectors moving again. So, so all of this stuff starts to, to happen both with other dealers being active in the US and, and galleries being reactivated and collectors being reactivated in Europe in the mid 1960s with, of course, one must say, the exception of Rudolf Leopold who amassed the, he, who, was Austrian and began collecting um, Sheila in the late 1940s, early 50s. Uh, and by the mid 1950s already had probably what was the, the world's largest Sheila collection. Well, J Jane, those are my questions for now. So let's, let's throw this out to the broader audience and see what they have to say or what they'd like to know. Okay, so I've, I've been trying to, you know, answer the questions as they're coming in. Um, David, do you have the chat feature on too? Can you see the questions or should I just be taking these? Unmute. <laughs> Unmute. I'm, I'm too busy muting myself. Okay. I know it's, it's a lot of technology. Um, do you want me to just answer the questions as they come in or do you want to ask them? I think if you can read them, um, if if I can help, I'm happy to. But uh, here's here's one. Let me let me just try and ask this one. Would you consider the American the American European or British collectors to be the most open to acquiring German expressionism? Now, now we're getting moving into German expressionism. So please uh, tell us. Okay, I will. Um, the British collectors forget about it. I mean, it's just been amazing. And Wolfgang Fischer, who was really responsible for Marlboro doing that Sheila show and who later left Marlboro and founded Fischer of Fine Art, I mean, he, the, the British were absolutely impossible. And only recently there's been, um, you know, there have been exhibitions uh, at the Courtauld at the Royal Academy, um, Richard Nagy, many people may know is a very active dealer based in London, but he caters as much to or more to an international clientele than he does to, to British collectors. Um, European, I would say within Europe, but not including Germany and Austria, um, there's been less 
interest overall in German and Austrian expressionism than there has been in the United States. I mean, the, the certainly a key center of the market for this material is, is, is and remains American. Um, what happened to your grandfather's Viennese gallery during and after the war? We got into that a bit. And the second part of the question is, and I'm sure this is not, this isn't the only person who's wondering this. How did he stay afloat financially in the 1940s and early 1950s? Okay. Um, so during the war, uh, what happened was that Vita Künstler had to really keep her head down a lot. And she was very limited in the type of art she could show and sell. Uh, she told a story, she, it, it had to be very realistic. And she told me a story once about a Nazi who came in and there was a landscape of a cow uh, standing um, in a field uh, and there was a shadow on the field and the Nazi said, you can't show this, there are no green shadows in nature. So that, that'll give you some sense of, of, of what Nazi tastes were like. And then after the war, uh, you know, Austria was bombed. The, the country was economically devastated. Um, and my grandfather really, he wanted to keep the, when he got, the gallery was restituted to my grandfather voluntarily. And my grandfather really wanted to keep it going, mainly for Vita's sake. He wanted her to have a living and an income uh, so long as she felt capable of working and wanted to work. So he would try to send her things, send her shows um, from New York, from the Gallery St. Etienne, so that she would have something, you know, to, to, to exhibit. Uh, and this is a little known fact, one of the many unpleasant things that the Austrians did that made it difficult for Jewish refugees who did get their businesses back to make a go of it. After the war, the country had currency concern, uh, currency restrictions. So hard currency could not be exported. So even if my grandfather sent, let's say, a Grandma Moses show, to Vienna for Vita to show and to sell. If she sold anything, she couldn't send him the money. So he, could, he couldn't get the money up for his own property out of Austria when he sold it. And he spent about a year, he just couldn't believe it, fighting with the Austrian authorities. And they told him, no, the money had to be placed in a blocked account a, a spare conto is like, a, you know, one of these words that we know well from what the, the Nazis put Jewish funds in blocked accounts too. And my grandfather could take money out of the spare conto when he was in Vienna and only to pay his hotel bills. Uh, and this is after the war. Um, do you want to, if you want to, you have to unmute if you want to jump in there. Yeah, sure. Um <laughs> Let's talk a little, there are a few more questions that are really coming in now. Do you, do you find that you need to take another approach when speaking to younger collectors and audiences about Austrian expressionism than with an older generation of collectors? Um, that's a really difficult question to answer. I think you have to mute again. Whenever I start talking, you echo. Sorry about that. Um, I think that, boy, that's really a hard question to answer because uh, I think that Austria, I, I think that younger, younger people, artists, not just collectors, you know, Sheila is adored by, Adolescence. I mean, I you know, I I I have people, you know, you know, teenagers writing me. They want to be Sheila. They say they have Sheila's genes. I mean, it gets, you know, kind of extreme. Um, on the other hand, um, you have 
so much crowding the space today in terms of what younger collectors are collecting, uh, in terms of collecting, uh, in terms of contemporary art, in terms of God help us NFTs, you know, there, there's always something new. Uh, and I don't necessarily find that uh, younger collectors are as attuned to the history and what they really need to know about the artist to collect intelligently. Um, Collier collected, Otto Collier collected autographs and manuscripts other than paintings, this person writes. Can you talk about that? And the writer says, I know of some Brahms autographs, for example. Uh, yes, he did. Uh, the again, the next web webinar, uh, Kalir as collector and scholar, is going to deal with all of the other things he collected. And he was an absolutely voracious collector who covered many, many, many fields. And yes, um, musical autographs and Brahms and Mahler and Beethoven and Haydn, yes. Jane, we've talked about things that were saved. Were there things that your grandfather could not bring out? Were there things, were there works that were lost? Yes, there were. Um, when he, again, mute please. Sorry. Uh, when he, uh, you know, he had, he, as I said, he, the contemporary, the more modern material didn't require an export license in, in May, June, 1938. Uh, but older material did, and he, like anybody, he had to apply for an export license. Uh, and when he did so, uh, the guy from the Belvedere who was uh, entrusted to review the collection went through everything and a few things he turned to the wall and he said, these we must sacrifice to the gods. That was his, the, the Nazi museum director's phraseology. Uh, and then of course, those things were left behind with Vita. So there wasn't, there wasn't anything for the Nazis per se to appropriate, but there were things uh, that Vita sold during the war that came out of the gallery's inventory. Uh, and my grandfather never, ever wanted to claim any of that. He said he, he wanted Vita to survive. He understood that in order to do that, she had to sell. And it was never his intention to claim what she sold. And now when restitution has uh, become, you know, sort of an issue we're sometimes approached by people, you know, you, you get prodded by certain parties who want to goad you into making claims. And um, it's been my father's and my aunt's and my sister's and my position that we will not make a claim where my grandfather chose not to do so. Uh, but he was, I have to say, very cognizant of the fact that many people um, had sacrificed their art uh, under conditions, you know, who had been forced to sell, uh, uh, you know, under different conditions. And he was also very, very active in helping to people to reclaim their art after the war if he knew a collector and he knew what they had lost. Uh, and again, that that subject, the subject of restitution, is something that we'll be talking further about on October twenty sixth. We have we have something else that could be something of a teaser for that. So let me ask you, what led Kalir to show Grandma Moses? Okay, so that that actually gets back to. Alyssa's question, which I didn't quite answer, which is how did we ever stay afloat in the 1940s and 50s until the market for Austrian and German expressionism kicked in? Uh, and my grandfather was 
full of ideas. I mean, he, he had a very, very, very broad variety of tastes. There were lots of things that he liked, you know, that just stimulated his interest, his visual interest. And he really liked the United States. Um, he was very happy to be here. Uh, and he hated um, modern American art. Uh, what he saw on 57th Street and in the museums in the 1930s, he thought was extremely derivative. Uh, he thought it didn't um, express the spirit of America that he was growing to love. And so he began looking for a more, more authentic American expression. And as early as 1941, um, he took a road trip to the American Southwest and he began collecting Native American art, uh, Native American pottery, uh, New Mexican Santos. He was very, very open to um, indigenous art and he was also very open to American folk art. Uh, and so, uh, in uh, 1940, uh, this collector who by the name of Louis Calder, uh, who is the one who really deserves credit for discovering Grandma Moses, he, he had bought uh, a collection of Moses paintings from the drugstore in Eagle Bridge, New York, near where Grandma Moses lived. And he was trying to interest dealers uh, in Moses's work. And when he came to my grandfather, my grandfather uh, saw the paintings and he immediately, you know, I mean, he, did, he, he, he didn't, it didn't bother him that the artist was unknown. It didn't bother him that the artist was almost 80 years old. He said, this is great stuff and I'll show it. Uh, so that was one of the ways and, and Grandma Moses um, was the hit right off the bat in 1940 and her career began to grow really to, to flourish after the end of World War II in 1945 and up through her death uh, in 1961 at the age of 101. That's a long time. Uh, that's a lot of work by Grandma Moses. Yeah. Um, here's another question. Did Vita acquire any other German expressionist works during the war and what happened to her and the gallery after the war and there was something that struck me also did Vita keep a wartime diary did she did she have any, any extensive writing about her experience of running the gallery or that, that would be great and, and I don't know um I think you know, if I, it's very hard for me to know exactly what Vita did during the war because there was no communication possible. Uh, once uh, the war, once World War II started, communication with Austria, I mean, I guess there might have been some communication in the I, did, I don't even think there was communication in the in the thirty in the thirty nine forty, but but certainly after forty two there was no communication. And if you if I look at the list of shows that Vita did during that whole period, she was clearly much much less active than my grandfather had been. And I think that business was constrained. I don't know that she did much much business during that period. I really have no idea. Um, after the war, uh, you know, as I said before, she returned the gallery to my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather's attempts to sort of jumpstart it with material from the U.S. did not work be because the Austrians um, would not allow him uh, to take any money out of the country. Vita. Um, at a certain point said that she was really tired. She just, you know, she appreciated the fact that my grandfather wanted her to have the gallery to run and to support herself. Uh, but she said she really, she didn't need it and she didn't want it. And then my aunt came back to Austria 
to run the gallery for my grandfather. And she really didn't want to run it either. She, she um, got a degree in psychiatric social work and became a psychiatric social worker in Vienna. She had absolutely no interest in being an art dealer. But um, on a skiing trip, she met a very, very prominent a collector of Austrian contemporary art, who was also a priest, Monsignor Maurer. And Maurer took over the, the Neue Gallery premises and he renamed the gallery, Gallery Neist St. Stefan. And that gallery exists to, it, to this day in the same space on the Grunanger Gasse in Vienna. Uh, gallery Nation San Stefan is a very, very preeminent gallery of contemporary art. Uh, they were just showing last week at Art Basel. David, now you have to unmute. Um, I'm learning very slowly. Well, uh, I think we've covered quite a lot. So um, maybe you want to tell people about the next session before we sign off. Absolutely. So again, thank you. Thank you, everyone, everyone in the audience. Thank you, David. Uh, you did a fabulous job. You'll get the hang of the mute thing one of these days. <laughs> I know it's not easy. Um, so yeah, so uh, this webinar is going to be uh, mounted, uh, I think, on the CLEAR Research website. You're going to be able to da download it uh, if you'd like. Uh, sometime uh, in the course of the next week, we'll also be sending an email with a link to the webinar to all of the participants. Uh, next, the next webinar takes place in a month on October 26th and will deal with my grandfather, as I said, as collector and scholar. So it's going to get in to all of these other things that we didn't uh, have time to talk about today. Um, I think you can sign up for that on the KRI website. Um, I know you'll all be getting uh, invitations to sign up for it in email. Uh, and I hope you'll all be able to join us in October. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.